We are now recording everybody. Okay. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Maria Volpe. I'm a professor at John Jay College in New York, where I teach sociology and dispute resolution. This monthly breakfast is co-sponsored by the Association for Conflict Resolution of Greater New York and the CUNY, that's the City University of New York Dispute Resolution Center at John Jay College. This breakfast is number 230. Uh, wait a minute. Good. Go ahead, Maria. We, uh, I started these breakfasts after 9-11 and uh, we <coughs> held them in person until March, 2020. We now have to actually date the year. Uh, it's 15 months that we are now uh, hand, uh, meeting virtually. And uh, for the foreseeable future, we'll be meeting virtually. We, we don't as yet have a date on when we can have large gatherings at the college. Each month, um, these breakfasts are organized by a wonderful group of colleagues, including Julie Denny, Chuck Newman, Matthew Latimer, and Nikki Borofsky. The breakfasts are recorded and they are posted online at www.acrgny.org. Everyone who registers for the breakfast will also get an email sometime next week from Nikki uh, with uh, the recording. And this morning, we are really delighted to have a most timely topic uh, from our colleague, Peter Coleman, who's at Columbia. This is not the first time Peter's been with us, Peter. Um, I don't know if you know it or not, but yesterday was your 10th anniversary of the first breakfast that you did for us on June 2nd, 2011. Uh, Peter did a breakfast on the 5%, his uh, earlier book on finding solutions to uh, seemingly impossible conflicts. And then he was with us again on October 2nd, 2014, when he talked about making conflict work, harnessing the power of disagreement. And then again on April 4th, 2019, uh, when he spoke about adaptive mediation, navigating conflict uh, dynamics and uh, derailers. So um, we are following your career. You've been incredibly prolific. And I'm going to turn this over to Julie, who will welcome you and introduce you more formally to the group. Take it away, Julie. You're muted. Thank you, Maria. Uh, yeah, I, I want to ride on Maria's coattails. We are beyond delighted that Peter has come back again to address this breakfast. You should know that we had 504 registrants this morning when we checked the numbers. Never do they all show up, but Peter is a big draw and we're really excited. He has a resume that goes on for pages. I told him I'm brutally cutting it so I'm going to give you a few highlights, but I'd rather have him talking to you than me outlining all the highlights. He's the professor of psychology and education at Columbia University. He directs the Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution. He's executive director of Columbia University's Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict, and Complexity. He's a renowned expert on constructive conflict resolution and sustainable peace. We need a lot of that right now. Um, he's researching conflict intelligence and systemic wisdom in order to navigate conflict constructively across all levels from family to nations. Um, he's won multiple awards. He's written several books, some of which Maria highlighted. Um, and currently he's working on a book with Columbia University Press that will be released this year. 
on breaking through the intractable polarization plaguing the US and other societies across the globe. The name of the book related to our topic today is The Way Out, How to Overcome Toxic Polarization. He's authored more than 100 articles. He's edited a blog and he's blogged on other people's blogs. His work has been featured in media outlets that we all know and love, the New York Times, The Guardian, The Chicago Tribune, Harvard Business Review, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that most of you will be relieved to know that he is also a New York State certified mediator and not surprisingly a, an experienced consultant. So Peter, take it away. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Maria. It's always a pleasure to uh, speak with this group. Some of you know that Maria was the first professional, I think, that I ever met in this field. Um, I think I was about 10 years old. I think she was about eight years old. And we were, <laughs> you know, she was still doing dispute resolution at that point on the playground. And, but uh, she was one of the first uh, uh, faculty that studied this field and that spoke knew so much about it and I went for her to her for consult um, you know a while back let's let's put it that way um, so you know good morning from New York City um, hopefully you're all well caffeinated um, I'm going to share some slides uh, for my presentation and if you have any problems seeing them let me know can everyone see these at this point Maria yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, all right. So um, yes, I'm gonna. I'm talking about this book. This book actually came out this week uh, on June first. Um, the way out: how to overcome toxic polarization. So I'll I'll talk about uh, the story behind the book, the science behind the book, and some of the applications of it. Um, and uh, as uh, Julie mentioned, I direct this center, the Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation Conflict Resolution, which is at Columbia. And um, it was founded by Mort Deutsch, who was sci a scientist who was very, a scientist and a practitioner, who was very interested in keeping, you know, empirical research as close to practice as possible and keeping them in dialogue. So we uh, published these handbooks of conflict resolution theory and practice. And they really are, uh, this is a space that is dedicated to trying to keep science as close to useful practice as possible and vice versa, because as you know, there is this tendency for this thing to, for, for science and practice to drift apart. Um, and so we do everything we can to you know, keep them in conversation with each other. Um, at the lab or at the Morton Deutsch Center, we built this lab, uh, which we call the Difficult Conversations Lab. Um, <coughs> it is what we call a capture lab which allows us to actually bring in disputants, have real-time conversations, and then measure everything from you know, physiology and facial differences, facial expressions to affective differences, how, you know, how people's feelings change dynamically over time and then how their thinking has, is changes. So it's a, it's a lab that allows us to study in real time changes that happen uh, with dispute, uh, between disputants. And it was because of this lab, and, and you know, we've published a fair amount of research on this through the years. A lot of it's been published in journals, academic journals that of course nobody reads, um, a couple of books, uh, including the 5%, which was uh, the book that I presented 10 years ago. Um, and, and today what I'll talk about is the implications and applications of this research and other research that's been ongoing to the problem of toxic polarization that we're experiencing in this country and that many countries around the world are experiencing. Um, so when this, uh, I started to work on this book um, because of the difficult conversation lab and that it had gotten some attention from press, I started to become, a, uh, be approached by certain well-intentioned groups uh, out, that, out there in the public that are trying to work, you know, actively, tirelessly to bring down the temperature, the partisan temperature that's occurring, like this group. So I was approached by My Country Talks. This started in Germany um, a, a couple of years back. 
um, today is in 30 plus countries, including the US. Um, and their method is that they have a website that you can go to, you can answer some questions on divisive issues, and then uh, they match you with someone in your area and encourage you to go off and have a conversation, a cup of coffee with them and talk. Um, and this idea of this approach is based on research on what they call contact theory, which has been around since the 1950s, uh, developed by a man named Gordon Alpert uh, to look at race relations, um, and which is a very useful theory, but the research on contact theory has refined it over the years and talked about specific places where that helps and places where it backfires. And with the particular conflicts that we're trapped in now, the political polarization and venom of our culture, um, what Pew has found is that when people just get together and talk to somebody on the other side, the vast majority of us are leaving disillusioned, more alienated, more frustrated, not feeling like we have more in common, but that we have less in common. And sometimes these encounters that these organizations encourage, um, which again, are not facilitated, they're just sort of go off and meet the other person, well-intentioned, but sometimes they backfire. Uh, and this is one example of that. This is a story that was in Die Zeit, which is the, uh, the founding organization, a German periodical, and uh, uh, Bastian Bergner, who is a journalist, had uh, come to the US uh, after Trump's election, met these two gentlemen uh, and befriended them and, and, co and covered them for about a year and really became, came to respect them and like them. And at some point he said, you know, let's bring them together because, you know, why not? They're, they're both decent people. And, and so they did, they came together in New York City and they went for a walk in the park and then they had to, went, late one evening to get together and um, everything went very well until somebody mentioned Colin Kaepernick's um, protest, the kneeling protest in the NFL. And from that, there, were, there was an explosion. And basically both of them started to, you know, as, it, as I think Bastian said, F-bombs started flying. They attacked, they, you know, verbally attacked each other. It got very tense. One stormed out, the other stormed out and Bastion could never bring them back together again. Uh, and this, unfortunately, if you push the organizers behind some of these initiatives that are unfacilitated, well-intentioned initiatives, they'll tell you that there are too many of these stories, right? And that is because these conflicts around, for example, Trump are deep and passionate and sort of true believers um, living in, you know, alternative opposing media ecosystems, you know, like these folks um, and these folks, which kind of can culminate in things like this. So, uh, so I started to write this book a couple of years ago, um, and my objective was to be as clear as possible about the nature of this particular problem that we're facing in this country and elsewhere, and um, about what science says that would helps with these things. Because again, it's not, these are not typical problems. They're not the kinds of conflict dynamics that many of us deal with, which are, you know, more resolvable kinds of things. These, this is a long-term deeply embedded uh, problem. And it, it requires that we think differently about it and work differently with it. So what I'll do just in our, my time today is I'll talk about toxic polarization, what that is. And, Spoiler alert is that it's bad and it's getting worse uh, and it's often terribly misunderstood. And then I'll talk about the science on why we're so stuck, which is actually quite good, but also I think mis misunderstood. Um, and mostly what the book is about is what can we do about it? So what I try to do is not lean too much in, in the book to the problem because I think there's good work uh, uh, describing the history and the context of political polarization and the factors contributing to that. There's a lot, Ezra Klein's book out on that is fantastic. So there, there are, there's good summaries of the science on why we're stuck, but there's very little about what to do about it. Um, and so that's what this book is, is, is about. So let me talk a little bit about the problem of polarization, which again is, is, is a natural phenomenon that we see in science. This is an image of, of, of a field of magnet, magnetism 
and two poles and how in this sort of field of energy, what you see is the elements get charged and then they become attracted to one pole and repelled by the other. And those are the kind of dynamics that happen in science and nature, right? Um, and so you can, you, we see this phenomenon everywhere. It's not a bad thing, it's just a thing, right? It's something that's part of our nature and our science. And political polarization as well is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's, an, it's a necessary thing, right? In a two party system, you need to have at least two points of view, if not multiple points of view that differ, that challenges the kind of main discourse or main policy um, in order to challenge us to move forward. And in fact, in the 1950s in America, there was a feeling that there was just little, too little polarization, there was too much overlap and we needed to differentiate the two. Um, so the political polarization is not the problem. Toxic polarization is the problem when we move into these tribal clusters and camps and we just ruminate within our group about them. Um, and this is an image from, from Twitter from 2017 of how, the, how political discourse on Twitter tends to evolve, which is that the reds talk to the reds and the blues talk to the blues and they share information, but we, we're in very little contact with the others. This is what in psychology we call autistic hostilities where you ruminate about the enemy, but don't, but have very little engagement or contact with them. This is toxic. And what the research tells us, and what I talk a little bit about in the book is some of the trends, some of the things that are measured around toxic polarization that are particularly concerning. One of the biggest is of course, affective polarization, how much we hate them, feel a sense of contempt for them, there's strong partisan dislike and distrust, and this is increasing and has been increasing for decades. Um, if you look at even back to 94, and 94 is an interesting time. Newt Gingrich uh, was just about to become Speaker of the House then, so I'll, I'll mention something about that. But since that time, something like 80% of the uh, of each party views the other uh, as unintelligent, selfish, ignorant, um, and trying to harm America. Um, and so our feelings of kind of coldness for them and warmness and loyalty for our groups is escalating, continues to escalate. Um, and that's one thing that's measured and tracked that's been happening for decades. But there's also what Pew calls ideological consistency. This is kind of tribal thinking. They measure the 10, you know, 10 divisive issues, immigration, you know, Obamacare or healthcare, um, homosexual rights, abortion, so very different issues, but they measure them over time. And they look at the degree to which within parties, those attitudes on those issues start to correlate and co collapse and the degree to which between the tribes, they move farther and farther apart. And here too, we're seeing concerning trends in that there used to be more of an overlap in the in the attitudes on many of these issues. And now you see much more coherence within our groups, which means that people's attitudes in, as a Republican or Democrat line up and are very coral, consistent across these 10 different issues. And basically what that means is that we're not paying attention. We're really thinking and, and believing in tribal ways, following the lead of our leaders uh, and not paying attention to what are immensely complicated issues, right? And, and being able to discern nuanced differences between them. Major concern, uh, concerning trend. There is also research on people's collapse of their social identity complexity. So you, you might have a, a different ideology and a you know, religious ideology and racial group identification, political identities, those are all converging. So we're seeing again within tribes, a kind of fusion of those differences we're seeing increases in perceptual distortion, which means that we believe that they are much more extreme and hostile in their attitudes than they actually are, which encourages us to become more extreme. Um, we're seeing major uh, outside effects, uh, sized effects of the extremes on both sides. So a study recently said that 80% of the content on Twitter is generated by 10% of the participants of the actors on Twitter. So that means that the extremists are driving the discourse, they're driving the conversation, they're framing the conversation. And so more moderate voices tend to either disengage or drop out. But what we then attend to 
on the, new, on the mainstream news and on the internet are extreme voices, which again contributes to our perception of how extreme they are. But two of the more concerning trends that I wanna point out is that we are actually physically geographically sorting in this country into red and blue pockets. And this is true, again, physically and virtually in terms of the internet sorting us or us sorting ourselves within the internet. Um, and it's not just against rural urban divides, but also within cities. The New York Times has done a couple of pieces on this. They had a piece a week or two ago where you could go in and uh, the article is called, do you live in a political bubble? You can put your zip code in and it will tell you exactly where you live and the degree to which you live in a homogenous, politically homogenous space. And most of us do, right? So there's more, even within cities, there's sorting into pockets of neighborhoods of reds and blues. So we're physically moving away from each other. This is where I am right now in this sea of blue on the Upper West Side of, of Manhattan. Uh, so I, I am you know, not safe from the same kind of seductive pull. Finally, um, we're seeing rises in hate groups and hate crimes and political violence, which is a nat natural um, culmination of these other trends. Um, white nationalist hate groups grew 55%, Trump era, hate crimes in pockets around the country are spiking um, and political violence such as what we saw on January 6th, you know, is more and more likely. Um, and so these kinds of conflicts, when you have these kinds of trends, they're bigger than us. And to encourage people to just get together and talk for a cup over a cup of coffee is not only ineffective, but it's unethical right, because it does set people up for what can be damaging kinds of encounters. So all of these things have culminated in what I call in the book, uh, a state of American psychosis. And this is where we live in these two parallel realities where we see the same action of the same man, and yet we view it in fundamentally different ways, that, you know, in opposing ways. Um, and this, again, is, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, but this is part of the state, which is kind of interesting and entertaining, but, you know, it is not sustainable. It is feeding into and contributing to the hostility that one group is feeling for the other and vice versa. But it's important to realize this is not about Trump. This is a trend that we've seen. For example, this is a, a voting in Congress in the House and the Senate uh, over the past, you know, almost 200 years. And what you see is this rising trend since the mid, mid 1970s in polarization, in the unwillingness, you know, obstructionism, and the unwillingness to cross the party lines and support the policies or legislation of the other side. Um, and this has been increasing for a long time and it really is at a place today where we're at almost total deadlock. You see this in the paper daily where there's just nobody really willing to move and engage constructively with the other side. So this has been happening in DC, but it's also been happening bottom up in communities and the, the two discourses are linked to each other. So one of the first things I did is, well, I have done, but did more intently for this book <clears throat> is to try to understand why we are so stuck. What is it that really contributes to this, you know, now 50 plus year trajectory of increasing hostility towards them? collapse of complexity, passions, right? What, what, what is driving this? And if you look at the research, you see that there are a lot of factors that people identify. This is oftentimes evidence-based empirical research. It's good research, but these are like pieces of the problem. So science, the bi biological science says that, you know, uh, red Americans and blue Americans have differing levels of, threat, of sensitivity to threat in their brains. So they're hardwired to be more sensitive to threat messages if you're conservative than if you're Republican. Ethnocentric or tribal psychology, you know, selective perception confirmation bias is that we only pay attention to information that reinforces our existing attitudes or authoritarianism. There are all these <coughs> individual or micro level factors that research suggests contributes to this. And then there's these macro structural factors like the simple fact that we have a you know, two party winner takes all political system. So ultimately we have to decide between them and us, right? 
government dysfunction, negative political campaigning, how effective that is, voter suppression, gerrymandering, the internet, the normless internet, the entertainmentization of media, all of these factors. And so what I, the point I try to make in the book is that there's a lot of science as to why we're stuck. And, all, and many of these pieces explain you know, some small piece of the variance of why we continue to hate each other and grow in that direction. But I also argue that to some degree they're right, but to a large degree they're all wrong because none of these things accounts for a 50 year trajectory. What does account for it is that these things start to align, feed each other in complicated ways. And that's what starts to lead to a runaway train, which can become more complex and ultimately leads to what I call a superstorm of polarization. You look at all, think of all those factors that I just laid out there and how they can align and reinforce each other. They do become this torrent, this, you know, this sort of vortex of polarization that we're pulled into that are bigger than us. It's not just us and our relationships with you know, our brother-in-law who differs from us, but it's the media we consume and where we do, do and do not travel, right? And how, you know, our, our internet life and experience and, and, and. So it's multiple lever, levels of things. And these are what Karl Popper, who was a philosopher of science, uh, referred to as cloud problems. Um, these are a particular kind of conflict or problem or divisive, divisiveness. He made a distinction in the 60s between clock problems and cloud problems, and that many or most of the problems we face in our life are more like clock problems. You know, there's a problem in a marriage, and so we sort of talk to them and realize, well, it's really when we talk about finances, or it's really that you're in a phase of your marriage where, you know, you're both have careers and you have kids and you're, you know, you're working all the time and Zoom and whatever, and you're, you know, of course you're having a hard time. So clock problems are those kinds of problems that you can kind of analyze, break apart, identify the core, you know, essence of them and try to fix that and change the problem. Cloud problems are different. Cloud problems don't lend themselves to that. They're, you know, and to the typical approach of science, which is to break it into pieces, find the piece that's broken and fix it. Cloud problems operate to, uh, um, according to a different set of rules and dynamics. They're ever changing, they're unpredictable, they're really hard to control. And we need to be able to see and understand the conditions under which those kinds of problems actually do change, but it's a different, lens and it's a different way to think about these things because one of the things I point out in the book is that what happens over time with complicated systems like this is that they settle into patterns as things reinforce each other and align they settle into strong patterns in our lives so let me give you a quick thought experiment so imagine you're uh, at your local favorite diner having a cup of coffee and in walks some guy and um, sits down next to you at the counter, which is fine, happens every day. But this guy sits down and, and, and puts his arm kind of into your arm. You know, like there's a plenty of room here, but sits sort of in your space. Now, again, at this point, you can react in any way. You might be in a good mood. It might not matter. You can shrug it off, you know. But this is like the first thing that happens between you. And so your what we call conflict landscape is kind of undeveloped. You could do a lot of different things, but you just sort of choose to ignore it. But then you start to notice what he's ordering, how he treats the waitress, he's slurping his food, and you start to build this kind of you know, landscape for assuming that this guy is probably a jerk. And then you start to sort of say and you know grunt or not even talk to him, but sort of indicate to him your displeasure with his being, which starts to trigger both of you into some kind of dynamic. And you haven't even spoken yet, but you're starting to develop this kind of grudge or pattern of negativity within your thinking and feeling and behaving. And as time unfolds, your friends and colleagues and people that work there and his start to cluster and 
then you start to see, oh, look, he's a follower of this person or that person. And you start to tie these differences, these negative feelings and experiences to political differences or racial differences or ideological differences that are clearly evident. And this thing just gets bigger and bigger until you get to a landscape where you know it's really hard to see or even think about this individual without getting sucked into it and this is a more intractable kind of divisiveness where there's you know very low probability that you'll ever experiencing anything po um, uh, positive about the other side so this is when all of these factors are somehow beginning to align and they create these landscapes for our life through which we experience our life and our relationships. And so in doing so, to focus on any particular conflict at any particular time, it's like trying to take this ball and push it out of this landscape when it's the landscape that is trapping us, drawing us in. It's sort of like an addiction. Addiction is a biopsychosocial structural problem that is not just within me and my relationships, but it's also in the places I go and the, you know, my, my economic condition, circumstances, my anxiety, my, you know, there are a variety of things that contribute to the patterns of addiction. And in fact, one of the things we we're finding from research, brain research on uh, Americans today is the power, the addictive qualities of outrage. We have become addicted to outrage. Outrage triggers in our brain pleasure centers similar to what heroin triggers. And so we start to get a taste, right, for this outrage. And so every morning we turn into Joe, Joe, tune into Joe Scarborough or Breitbart and get our sense of righteous indignation, which becomes addictive. It's not just about us, but it's about this sort of system of forces. So one of the things we know about these kinds of patterns that settle in and become so strong is that they are really hard to change. They resist change. There's just too many things that are drawing us in. And so how we think about change has to change. And so, and this is something I think might, that might be particularly interesting to, to this group. Um, but what I explain in the book is that, you know, there is our typical, you know, clock fixing, you know, cl conflict theory and how we think about change. You know, you think about it as going in and finding the problem and fixing it or addressing it or expressing it. And, getting people to talk about it and come to an agreement and you sort of move on. And that's a, a, a way of thinking about addressing conflicts like this that um, works most of the time, but not with cloudier problems. With cloudier problems, we need to really have a different theory of change. We need to reflect on how do we understand how this is going to change, what our role is, what we need to do, how do we define it, and so I lay this out just conceptually because I do think it's important that we change channels. We really go from left brain, more kind of linear logical thinking to right brain, which is seeing the big picture and understanding the emotional dynamics more clearly. Um, and so I lay this out specifically, but what I wanna point out in terms of the good news is that what the research on deeply divided societies tells us is that there are a few basic conditions that are oftentimes necessary conditions for societies to pivot and escape toxic polarization, escape international war, escape you know, bloody civil wars. Um, and this is from studying you know, hundreds of in internal civil wars or international wars um, that a few things matter. So one is that you need to have enough people that are in what they call a mutually hurting stalemate. They feel pain, they're miserable, they're exhausted. They're tired and fed up with the status quo. This is ripeness theory. And the good news is we are. You know, there's a group called More in Common that studies polarization around the world and in America, and they estimate somewhere between 86 and 93% of Americans in the middle today are exhausted, fed up, and really looking for a change, that they may be disengaged at this point, but they want out of this trap. So that's good news. What's also good news is that another condition that helps us change during these times is when we hit bottom. 
when there's a shock of some nature that destabilizes us and makes us really question our assumptions and our basic decisions. And this is again, like when an addict hits bottom, but today we have COVID-19. We're all on Zoom for a year and a half now. We have an economic downturn. If you walk down Broadway here, you know, most of the storefronts are either boarded up or closed. You know, this is an extraordinary time of awareness of racial injustice. You know, there's a constellation of things that are really destabilizing our society. And what the research tells us is those conditions can create a ripeness for people to be willing to shift and change, right? They're miserable, they feel destabilized, but what they need is some sense of how to do it. Like what's the alternative? What is the way out? What is the way to move forward? And that's what this book focuses on is I really uh, um, summarize it or synthesize it into five basic um, practices or modes of engagement that are all evidence-based. They come from science and they help us think about if we feel kind of trapped in this situation and want out, what are the things we can do in our life that can lead in that direction. So what I'll do in, in, in the next couple of minutes is just give you a taste of what these things are. Again, what I do in the book is I, I, I tell a story, I talk about the science, and then what I try to do is say, this is how you can do it in your life, in your family, in your community, in your society. So I walk through what it looks like in practice, right? Um, so let's start, start with re reset, capture new beginnings. And this is again, from the study of complex systems and divided societies and the conditions under which they change. And one of the things we learn is that after a reset, once there is a, a destabilization, like we're all emerging from right now, what happens is the, the, the system, the patterns are very sensitive to changes, the, you know, the first next things you do. What are the first things you do when you try to talk to your brother-in-law or when you, you know, see it go out into your community? This is a time that is very sensitive to these changes. So one example I give is talking about how you think your assumptions about change. How do you think about them? Whether you're a Republican, you think about Democrats or Democrats or Republicans or, you know, left-leaning, right-leaning, leaning, um, independent. How do you think about them? Do you think that they're ever going to change? And this is research that comes from uh, the Middle East, um, where what they find is that if you believe they're never going to change, and we're never going to change, and this situation is never going to change, then guess what? It's never going to change, right? Because you either disengage, or if they get in your face, you attack them. Those are your options. If you start to believe that, well, maybe some of them do change, then you consider opening up to engaging in a very different way. And so this is a basic assumption that we all have, it's an implicit theory, but what this research has shown is that, particularly if an Israeli, for example, witnesses Palestinians who say, enough, we wanna speak for peace, we wanna move in this direction, these are the things we wanna do. The more that Israeli sees the other do that, the more likely that they will sense that there's a possibility for change. So let me give you one such story in America. Right now, there's a committee in Congress, which not many people know about, called the Select Committee for the Modernization of Congress. It started about a year ago. Uh, it they, they, they use this kind of thing every 20 or 25 years when Congress gets so dysfunctional, and it really is an attempt to fix Congress. And this particular committee is a bipartisan committee. It's chaired by uh, Derek Kilmer, who's a, a Washington State Democrat, and um, William Timmons, who's a South Carolinan Republican. Um, and they have six Republicans and six Democrats on it. They equally share the budget. They do consensus decision making. It's a highly bipartisan initiative within our Congress, right? Within the belly of the beast. Um, that is uh, actively attempting to take a hard look at why are we so stuck in Congress and what can we do to change? And what's interesting is they were given a one-year mandate uh, and they put out 98 different recommendations. I'll tell you one. Uh, and after the first year, you know, the freshman class and another group of, of Congress people wrote Nancy Pelosi and said, you got to extend this group. 
because this is, you know, this is hopeful, this is promising. So what, let me tell you one of the recommendations. One of the recommendations is in Congress, when new Congresses start up, what you see is the freshmen show up and they put the Democrats on the Democrat bus and the Republicans on the Republican bus and they drive in different directions and off they go, right? That's like the first thing, the initial condition that happens for their incoming freshman class. And so you can imagine how that starts a process that is kind of self-organizing. And so their recommendation to Congress is don't do that. <laughs> you know, don't start that way. You know, start in a different way where they can meet and get to know each other. And you know, you you can have partisan differences, you can have different caucuses, but why would you start that way, right? So that's just one example of seeing when both sides are coming together and trying to do something more reasonable, and that can change our own assumptions about change. Um, okay, uh, Maria, I'm hoping I'm doing okay on time. I just have about, say, five or 10 more minutes left. Hopefully that'll work. Somebody will tell me. The second practice is what we call um, bolster and break. And this is simply that when you are trapped in a system that is deep and you know polar so polarizing um trying to bring in outsiders to fix it or yourself with a new idea or a new project some is oftentimes it's just rejected the system is too powerful it's too much bigger than you so what we recommend you do is understand well what is already working in the system what are the processes that are working in the system this is something that in organizational science they call positive deviance. Who are the groups that are already working effectively to bridge the divides? Um, and I'll say that um, in, i am just got a report that my, my internet is stable enough. Um, in America, um, there are these groups that are already doing this work. Our, our co colleague, Laura Chasen, who used to work for Essential Partners, um, used to call them the networks of effective action. She would say, when I go into a community that is deeply divided, the first thing I ask myself is, who's already in conversation across the divide? Who's willing to continue that? And it's sometimes unlikely sources, um, but this is uh, promising. and. If you go to this website, which is the Bridging Divides Initiative at Princeton, run by a woman named Neelan Parker, what they're doing is they're mapping all of the bridge building groups that exist across the country. To date, there are something like 7,000 of them that they've identified. And if you click on the map, it's interactive. You can see in your community, who are these groups? These are the positive deviants that are oftentimes aware of the science, good at facilitation, it's a particular kind of facilitation, right? It's not necessarily mediation. Oftentimes it isn't. It is more dialogue facilitation that moves into kind of joint uh, activism, action planning and action, action groups. Um, but these exist all over the country. These, this is the positive deviance. This is where we should start. This is what I've recommended to the Biden administration that they do is they not come in with some new shiny half-baked plan but they encourage and support participation in the existing, what I call the community immune system, because there is this immune system that exists across the nation and within communities that is critical. Um, so the third practice that I talk about in the book is to complicate your life. And this is, uh, was the premise of the book, The 5%. This comes from out of our research in the Difficult Conversation Lab. And it really is the idea that if we get to a place where we really think in us them terms and the issues are framed in highly simplistic ways like build the wall, don't build the wall, then we need to reintroduce nuance into our thinking, our feeling, our behaviors, our, you know, where we travel, um, and that there are many ways to do this, right? Um, so this is what research has told us again and again is that we need to kind of reintroduce contradictory complexity into our types of conflict management in order to um, have more constructive forms of this. So let me give you two quick examples. So one is called, uh, so, so this is happening in journalism. This is my colleague, Amanda Ripley, who's a journalist. 
She studied, she may have met some of you, she studied mediators. She just wrote a book called High Conflict where she features a mediator. And she um, was interested in what does the mediation peace building field have to offer journalists uh, for reflecting on how they contribute to polarization and how they can mitigate it. And she wrote this great story that went viral for a group called Solutions Journalism, which is trying to help journalists to be better. Um, and really, it, the, the point is that you know the, the method of reporting, which is you find a conflict, you find two parties that are opposed, you highlight that opposition. Um, that's the business model of so much reporting. It's in an attention economy. You want to have some sparks that get people's attention because then you get more clicks and you get more, you know, you have, have job security. So the, the the infrastructure of reporting is like that. And what what Amanda's pointing out is that that contributes to polarization intentionally or unintentionally, um, and that there are other ways that reporters could go about reporting that maybe would introduce more nuance into people's understanding of these highly complex issues. So that's one way of complicating our lives is complicating our media, our what we're exposed to, who we listen to, who we think with. Um, another is this, I wrote a piece in the, in, this goes back to Newt Gingrich, that this is a story some of you may know, but Newt Gingrich, when he was Speaker of the House, Republican uh, Speaker of the House, uh, changed the work week in Congress from five days to three days and said to his caucus, don't move here. Don't bring your families here. Stay back in your home state. You can raise more money there. If you come in for three days, just come and live in your office or live in an apartment with a couple of people in our party, but don't fraternize with them because they're the problem. And this was, you know, really a weaponization of politics as war. And this is one of the reasons why we see such spikes in both DC, but in America, um, because what he did, again, by going from five days to three days and saying, don't move here, is he removed the cross-cutting structures that had existed in Washington for you know, many, many decades, which is that if you have families that grow up together, live together, grow up together, um, your children grow up together, it's very difficult to vilify the other and essentialize the other because you have relationships, you have ties with the other side. He removed that, and we're seeing the impl implications and consequences of that today. All right, and just two more quick points. One is, um, one of the things that we do in our field is we, when students come to us with difficult disputes, we say, sit down at the table opposite each other and let's try to talk it out. And one of the things that neglects is the reality that human beings for, you know, we basically developed our cognitive capacities by moving together in groups out in the Sahel, right? We were hunters and gatherers and foraging, and that's how we solved problems. And so now we tell people to sit down and talk, um, and we lose what can come with movement and synchronization. So there's, you know, new research on this, which is interesting. This is a great paper by a former student of mine, Christine Webb, talking about the neuroscience behind the value of disputants moving together, ideally moving together physically outside, you know, side by side. Um, this uh, Abraham's Path is an initiative built by Bill Urey and a, and a group of folks that is in the Middle East, which encourages, you know, different denominations of religious actors and disputants to come together and walk where Abraham walked with his family, right? These kinds of opportunities tap into uh, what happens neurologically, which is when we move with people physically, we synchronize and we feel more compassion and cooperation. And I think our field is really missing the opportunity to really capitalize on the value of this, and particularly with difficult conflicts and these bridge building organizations, they seem most effective when not only do they bring people in dialogue together, but eventually they mobilize and work on something together, physically getting up and creating a garden or addressing a grievance within their communities. All right, and then finally, you know, adapting. So complex systems are unpredictable and complex problems are unpredictable. And so you may have some great, you know, solution that's having a positive impact, but then it backfires or it, it stops working, right? 
So we need to be more adaptive. This is based on this work by um, Dietrich Dorner, called this book called The Logic of Failure. And his premise is that there's more harm done by well-intentioned people like us trying to do good in the world who are not mindful of the unintended consequences of well-intentioned actions. This kind of goes back to what my country talks is, is trying to do, right? These are well-intentioned folks causing harm maybe unethically because they're not mindful of the unintended consequences of what they do. This is an image of a game that some of you may be familiar with. It's the peacemaker game. It is the Israeli-Palestinian game. What we've done is research on what are the competencies that allow people to navigate this game more effectively. Effectively, It's a highly complex game. There's a lot of weird things that happen when you try to do good things because it's a complex system. We study the conditions under which decision makers do less harm and increase well being under this. And that's what this chapter ends with is those competencies and those conditions. Um, the book culminates in taking these ideas, these kind of five buckets of ideas, and translating them into simple new rules for you adjustments, nudges you can make in your life when you feel trapped and you want to try to do something else. But in order for you to have some sense of that, you will need to either buy the book and ideally then go to the website because on the website there are exercises that are associated with each of the chapters about how to practice these different modes of experience in your life. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that. That's my presentation, that's my talk, that's my sense of the way out. I will tell you one thing, and I didn't know this when, when the book was named The Way Out, but apparently in AA, when they were first writing and developing what is called the big book, which is the sort of, you know, 12 step program, it, the working title was The Way Out. They were trying to find how to escape toxic addiction. So somehow seren through serendipity, that's what this is called as well. Okay, so uh, I am happy to entertain questions. I'm not sure if Julie or Maria or Chuck or someone is going to field those questions. I think so, right? Julie, you're uh, muted. Yeah, and Nikki, Nikki, you're, you've been watching. Hang sure. on. Okay, there's a lot of comments about other resources and how uh, a lot of comments about the international aspects of what you're discussing. Questions, I'm looking for questions. Nikki, how, have you seen any? Uh, there's a recent uh, question about um, how the arts could help mm. uh, contribute to reconnecting and restoration. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Arts are, uh, again, you know, what I sort of mentioned earlier is that we need to approach these kinds of problems from a more right brain, big picture way. And the arts are one great way to tap into that hemisphere of our experience of the world and our thinking because it can be evocative and moving. I'll, I'll tell you one example. Um, so some of you will be familiar with uh, StoryCorps, which is Dave Isay's uh, NPR project, which is now decades long. I think they have 650,000 people have participated in StoryCorps the, and, and all of those stories have been logged in the Library of Congress. It's the largest compendium of human stories in history. And they over the past several years have been trying to do something called one small step. Okay. So they're trying to take the methodology of StoryCorps and use it uh, to depolarize America and encouraging reds and red and blue strangers to come together and have a conversation. But what's really important about what they do, what they're doing is fantastic. They've been very thoughtful and systematic about it. And they're very informed by the research about what not to do. And one of the things that they do is they encourage people that are willing to come together to um, not talk politics, but to begin with their story. They write down their stories. They check a bunch of things like, they, do they have children? What kind of work do they do? You know, whatever, where they come from, what part of the country? And then they're matched with people, um, not on wh which they're opposed, but around common things that they share. And the first thing they do is the other, you read my story and I read your story aloud. So that's how we start. And so the power of stories and narrative, which in fact, you know, if, if some of you are familiar with, there's a movement in medicine called narrative medicine, which is using stories and questions 
to help physicians understand the human context in which problems are presenting themselves to better work with you know, clients and not just diagnose them and get the hell out of there, right? Doctors are, are fixers. And this is trying to say there's a context here that you need to understand in order to do no harm, in order to really have sustainable solutions. It's very parallel to this. So the only thing I'll say is that the power of stories that we see in StoryCorps, that we see in happening in one small step and in a narrative medicine is one profound way to move people emotionally and open them up to more of a nuanced understanding of myself, them, and others. There are a lot of people who have raised their hands, so I'm going to call on them. Uh, Ellen Marks, unmute yourself. Alan Marks, there you go. Okay. Uh, lower there we go. Here. Now there I'm unmuted. Go. Now I'm unmuted. So um, first of all, I, it's fascinating what you've what you've written about and what you're doing, and the whole idea of bringing people together and finding common ground is always something that I'm interested in. But I noticed a few things that uh, were questionable for me. Um, the first thing I don't understand is, is the idea of polarization. You showed the scientific idea that um, things that are attracted to and repelled by opposing forces of energy. And if I remember anything about science, um, those that, that, that are the similar are not attracted to, they are in fact always always opposed to uh, forces of energy in terms of magnets uh, as my first uh, thing. The second thing is um, in when you were showing different ecosystems, uh, it was like preaching to the choir. I noticed the first two pictures you showed were of um, January 6th uprisings. And I, I think the, the whole idea of polarization exists if you were to show a Black Lives Matter meeting where the angry people were shouting. I think the problem for me, let, me, let me correct you one second, Alan. That the first picture I showed was from January 6th. The second picture I showed was from a, a Portland uh, FIFA, um, Black Lives Matter movement. So I, apolo I apologize. They were from both sides, yeah. I apologize. I didn't see any people of color in the picture. And well, so I was very intentional about that, uh, those photos, yes. Okay, so so the whole idea, and I that's thank you for clarifying that, is the is that I think that the people in the uh, if we're going to take the we and they mentality, the people on the other side are also doing their scientific research and doing the very thing in the opposite way as to how do I stir people up? How do I get them to be divided? How do I divide and conquer? Um, how, do you, how do you address that? Because they're, they're not doing that openly. They're not saying this is what we're trying to do. They are stirring up the populace and sitting back and watch, watching, the, watching the circus, watching the gladiators, watching us fight each other. How do you address that that reality and the, the the making of the we and they by people who are who don't even hold themselves as we and they they hold themselves above the fray? Yeah, so I guess I'll say a couple of things. Let me address that first. Um, so um, you know, this is what you're what someone have, someone have called the outrage industrial complex. There is an outrage industrial complex out there that is preying on these divisions, that is leveraging these divisions. Now let me let me let me talk a little bit about that, but let me say one thing first. Many, many, of, many of the Congress people that I've spoken to feel as trapped by this as we are. So they're not crazy about the idea of hating who they work with, of vilifying them, of attacking them, but they also see some kind of long game in survival and politics in here. But they too feel trapped by this. And I think that's an important thing to recognize is they're not all bad actors. There are definitely bad actors out there, you know, but that's not necessarily true in, in politics. But you're absolutely right that there is uh, benefits in leveraging fear and threat. Um, this is, again, this is one of those many factors is that they're particularly the right tends to be very responsive to messages like they're coming for your daughter, right? So, and, and these actors know that, they weaponize that and it works, but it's not just politicians, um, it's the internet. So one of the stories I tell in the book is I was invited two years ago via Twitter to a pop-up meeting on polarization on the internet. And it was a group of internet folks and they had a couple invited a couple academics. And so I went to this meeting, I walk in, there's about a dozen folks 
And they are like, you know, Google executives, Jigsaw executives, uh, Facebook, one of the found, co-founders of Facebook was there. So it was a really interesting group of people. And the convener wrote up on a whiteboard the question, what kind of dialogue should we be having in order to promote a healthy virtual society? And I said, what do you mean by dialogue? And then there was silence. And I said, because most people that use that term mean debate, right? They mean that, you know, you have an idea or a position, particularly in politics, and I present mine, and then I listen to yours, and I try to find the flaws in your argument. And so debate is a game to win. It is a game around persuasion, and it is very pervasive in our culture, right? Law, uh, politics, um, high school, you're trained to debate, right? It is like it's in our DNA that we automatically move into that, and we call that dialogue. And the truth, but the truth is, as many of you know, in my world, dialogue is the opposite. Dialogue is not a game of winning an argument. It is a process of opening and discovery and learning and sharing of stories, right? So, and dialogue is not something that's familiar to most Americans. You do see dialogue sometimes, or at least monologues in AA meetings where people open up and share their stories. But, or in Quaker meetings where people sort of stand up and share their sense of what's important right now. Um, but you don't see many spaces for dialogue. So I, I laid out this distinction in this room of executives uh, 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 of the major platforms. There was another pause and then this co-founder of Facebook said, oh, well, if um, that's dialogue, then there is no major platform that promotes dialogue because all of these platforms are about social comparison, competition, contention, and challenge, and provocation. That's the coin of the realm. That's what gets all the attention. And that's the business model. And of course, you know, Facebook was one of the leaders of this. They set this up. You know, what their website says is, you know, we're trying to build a, a, a broader community. And my question is, what kind of community are you building? because you're building a community of competition and competing for attention, competing for status, and that's not dialogue, right? So um, one of the things that concerns me is that some of this is weaponized for political purposes. A lot of it's weaponized for business purposes, the business model behind, and, it, and it's not just the social media, it's mainstream media and entertainmentization of news, right? So you're absolutely right. There are these major forces that are out there that are about triggering our more primitive tribal fears and competitive instincts. But some of it's intentional, some of it's built into capitalism. Um, and that's part of the superstorm that I'm describing. I, I, All right, Alan, Alan, we've got lots of people who have questions. Can we- Alan, I'm happy to follow up at some other point. Yeah, good. Um, Maria Morris in Morristown. <laughs> Unmute yourself. Hello. Yes, I did. How are you? Good. I'm Maria. And thank you for this. Um, just to follow up on the uh, previous person who was asking questions and you were discussing the business models of the online supposed dialogue, there is no dialogue when you have something called cancel culture. Okay. When somebody who says something you don't like, Twitter comes out and boom, you're banned. What is that? Now, you know, there's people who will say they have, you know, um, some kind of protection legally. I don't know the ins and outs of that. But when we were all locked down for COVID, Twitter, Facebook were the public square and we had no freedom of speech because every other day, it seemed somebody was getting canceled. And generally, they were all on the right. Well, yeah, okay. people on the right are canceled. Yeah, no, I, it's a good question. Um, so, yeah, when someone said that you, you, know, you look, uh, in order to understand the nature of the society, you have to look at how they treat their dis dissonance and their dissenters. Right. And it's absolutely right that cancel culture, cancel culture is on both sides, right? And it is a purification of your side. Um, and so it's much newer, it's getting a lot of attention on the left because 
millennials are very intolerant of you know any kind of diversity of view. You have to be a pure social justice warrior. But it's been around on the right for a long time, right? If you're not a true believer, you're out. So cancel culture is part of the problem. It is an oversimplification of, of the world. It is a, it is a um, essentialization of what we should or could stand for. It is a, is a shrinking of the tense on both sides. And again, let me just say, 80% of the content on Twitter comes from 10%. And those 10% are, are actively going after and purifying their side. Um, particularly when, if you look at, remember that image that I showed, you know, the right's talking to the right and the left's talking to the left, you know, so they're basically policing each other. That is part of the dynamic and part of the problem, but it's, to some degree, it's occurring on both sides. On college campuses, the right is unwelcome, right? That's been a, a growing tendency for decades. John Haidt has written, John Haidt has written about that, but others as well, right? That that more university, more liberal institutions are very intolerant about uh, more traditional conservative points of view. Um, and that is a, a problem. And what we're seeing in the internet is the um, amplification of that problem because the internet, A, has this business model of attack is good, uh, and B, because it's a normless wild west society. The internet, as you remember, has not been around that long. Facebook has not been around that long, right? And, and there aren't these good, there aren't good norms of practice in most of these major platforms. The exception is um, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is an interesting thing to look into because they do monitor, they throw people off if they're vitriolic. Uh, so you can't be a contributor if you become ridiculous and hostile. Um, so you have to play within their rules that are shepherded by them. But what their research finds is that when there are political issues that are being developed in Wikipedia, they're much higher quality when you have very divergent, divergent points of view contributing, but in a civilized way. And those, um, you know, and that is the model for the internet, which is very promising, but is not the business model of Facebook that has 3 billion followers, right? I understand that, but you know, with cancel culture, you also have the press coverage to reinforce that cancel culture. Yeah, no, you're absolutely- And that's, that's craziness. There is, well, it, it, is, it is what it is. Yeah, These exactly. are all amplifying factors, right? Um, and you're right, the, the right seizes on the left's cancel, cancel culture and looks at the most ridiculous examples of that and highlights that, but as I said, it's kind of because cancel culture on the left is relatively new and novel, right? And so it's like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know they were doing that. It happens on both sides to some degree. Right now, it's particularly weaponized by the right against the left. And you know what? The left er deserves some of this because some of the stuff that the left is doing is crazy. Well, you know, also when you have Twitter, Facebook canceling a, pre a former president, I think that's insane because they're infringing upon our free speech when sometimes the only speech people had during COVID was in these online forums. Yeah. Okay, let, let's let's move on. Okay, so if you don't like what I said, that's okay. No, that's not it. It's just, there are lots of people with their hands raised. Um, Sephora, unmute yourself. Sephora, Sephora. Is it my turn? Yes. Okay. So I, I'm, I, you know, I'm kind of dealing with this right now in a microcosm experience. Uh, I'm mediating between a black uh, teacher and two white teachers. And although the black teacher brought a racist comment that, sh that the two white teachers made um, to the union and, and they decided to go ahead and mediate um, she backed off and it looks like um, kind of left the two white teachers with no place to have a dialogue or, or reach an understanding. It almost feels like 
from the black teachers, my, my experience of it is that she kind of wanted to keep the polarization. She doesn't really, she, she, she said she'll come, in, come to it and then she backed up, leaving the white teachers feeling very uneasy with not bringing closure to some comments that were made that weren't intended. But my, my concern is that I see more of this polarization that, that even if there is an opportunity for a dialogue or coming together, um, it, it's almost like in her benefit to do it because keeping, keeping that Black Lives movement alive in some ways is she's more committed to that than to really having an opportunity. And I kind of I, I'd like you to respond to it because as a mediator, I'm I'm concerned because this is the second time I'm seeing that kind of dynamic. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a big challenge to certainly our field. You know, so I'm a member of a couple of what they call brain trust groups that are looking at this issue and looking at from a social justice perspective, uh, division, polarization, escalation is good. It draws attention to injustices, yeah. it mobilizes you know, the, the actors, and it's necessary. From a dispute resolution or peace building perspective, um, you know, it's a problem that you need and you need to kind of de-escalate. And, and the question is like, how do you, where do you find balance within that where there is sufficient tension and attention and reform, particularly issues on race, which is you know, race and, and genocide are the original sins of America. So here, how do you, in, you know, uh, encourage and instill that and still be peaceful? My position is this. My position is activism is important and good, and I am all for it. And in fact, I participate in a lot of it. What, what the problem is, is when we, we have no, there's, you know, we've, lo we've become derailed. There are no guardrails to our process anymore. They have w been whittled away. <laughs> And so you see these vitriolic attacks and you see increases, increases in hate crimes and violence and, and in political violence. That's unsustainable. And that is what concerns me. What I'm re re recommending here is that we find ways in our own lives, in our work, um, and in our communities that can help re reintroduce those guardrails. So mediation is one of those guardrails. But you know, some things, as you know, are not mediatable. And maybe shouldn't be mediatable, or maybe the time is wrong, right? One of the things we learned from the study of mediation is sometimes you need to have several failures in order to have the parties be sufficiently ripe or conditions change in such a way that they're ready, willing to come together. So, um, you know, so again, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think it's a very difficult balance, but this may, need, may not be something that could or should be fixed right now there. And again, what oftentimes happens, as you know, is that these teachers are in a system. They're in a school with you know, parents and teachers and administrators and in a community that are probably part of what they're trying to work out. And maybe it's less about them and more about the system that they're in. So that's always, to me, a question for the mediators is, is, are these the people that need to be in this conversation or does the conversation need to be broadened? Yeah. There are, I, I just want you to know we're monitoring all of this, Katerina and then Jess and then Timothy so far and uh, Mark Kleiman has been typing away madly. <laughs> I commend uh, the chat section for all of you. There are lots of wonderful references to groups and books and articles. So uh, we, we're, we only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to cut to Katerina right now. Unmute you. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, Peter, for a very interesting talk and for your research on a uh, super important subject today. Uh, so my question is, I'm thinking that when you put two people who are from different ideological perspectives together and you get them to talk to each other, the danger is that once people realize that they disagree on multiple subjects, then they start thinking that the reason why the other person disagrees with them is they're an evil person and that's why they're consistently wrong on all these issues. Yeah. But it occurred to me that if you were able to put 
two people together and limit the conversation or suggest that they limit it to one specific issue that has occurred. And ideally an issue that has not been like already hyped up by the press. And you get them to exchange their views on that incident. I mean, to take the George Floyd, George Floyd is already one that has been hyped up, but if it hadn't been hyped up, it would be an example where they could say, oh, but he's a, you know, George Floyd is a criminal, so he deserved what happened. Or the other person would say, of course, like a, a cop shouldn't murder a citizen <laughs> for no reason. Um, but I could see a meaningful exchange happening as long as the conversation was somehow circumscribed around a particular issue that wasn't very abstract. And so I'm wondering what you think about that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I think the challenge with that in the current environment is that these micro issues, and you know, George Floyd is a great example of that, are symbolic and tap into the larger problem. And they trap in, tap into then tribal differences. Um, and, and, and we can't artificially uh, remove those, right? That it, it's too, they're too powerful. Um, I, I think the, the, to me, the issue is, what are the processes that we think are useful in terms of bringing people together today? And again, I'll go back to what the story core Dave, I say one small step folks do, which is to say, don't talk about the issues. Tell each, you know, what they're trying to do is get people to connect in a human way and have enough of a emotional experience with some other human being that it becomes harder to, to essentialize them and vilify them, even if you differ on the issue. You know, let me just say, I start the book in the introduction with a detailed uh, version of a story many of you are familiar with, but it is a, um, was a pro-life, pro-choice abortion debate, a dialogue process that took place in Boston after a, a terrible shooting there in the 90s. And it's a, it's a parable for what I'm talking about because what they did eventually after the shooting is that Laura Chasen and Susan Podziba, um, which were affiliated with the um, uh, essential partners at that time, no, that was called the Public Conversations Project at that time. They had networks in the in the both the pro-life and pro-choice community. They identified three what they thought were you know influential voices on both sides, and they invited them to a clandestine dialogue. Um, they asked them to come together, wow. and both sides were terrified about doing that and, um, and you know, somewhat resistant, but agreed to for a short period of time for one month to come together and have a conversation. And it was difficult and it was well facilitated, well designed, the designs were vetted on both sides of the aisle with the communities um, and they talked for a month. Um, then they decided to extend it. Eventually they extended it to the one year anniversary of the shooting and then they extended it again and again. These women met in secret for five and a half years. And what happened in that five and a half years is phenomenal. On, in 2001, they co-published uh, an article called Talking with the Enemy. They came out publicly in the Boston Globe with all six of their names and said, this is what just happened. And here's my point. What happened was, they agreed to tone down the rhetoric, to speak from the heart about why, tell their stories about why these things were important. It was well facilitated. They felt physically safe, you know, they protected each other. Um, and what happened over time is that they grew profound affection for one another and respect. And so their relationships changed profoundly and they became more divided on the issue of abortion. They became further apart, but they all decided to change their activism because they felt that they were partially responsible for creating the conditions where you had this horrible violence, that the rhetoric had heated up so much. So they worked together to say, how do we not do that? How do we protect each other? How do we work together to change our activism? Um, and they became further apart on that issue. And I think that's a really interesting paradox because Abortion, if you're, particularly if this is your life cause, it's not something that we're gonna negotiate and come to an agreement on, right? It's just too deep 
and the, the differences are too wide, but they could agree to care and love and respect one another and, and take care of each other and to not poison their community um, in their work on their activism. So I just, I, I offer that as, again, I offer that in the book as a parable about how these kind of small things take time, are very difficult, need to, need to be well um, facilitated and designed and adaptive, um, but ultimately can have second and third and fourth order effects in our communities in terms of how they change the climate and the tone and the discourse and the probabilities of violence. Okay, um, Jess, you're next. And, and I see that Mark now has his hand up again. I thank you so much. Go. Uh, thanks so much. So I'm really curious about if toxic polarization is or necessitates toxic people and toxic leaderships, or if it's merely the toxicity of the interaction. And I'm thinking about Jean Lippmann Blumen's notion of what toxic leadership is and her construction of hot groups specifically. So I'm not familiar with that research, but I will say that it, to me, it's a dynamic. So if you're a divisive, if you believe division serves your purposes and you're a political leader or you run a business, um, then you're more likely to take advantage of those opportunities to divide in order to build up your power base, build up your market share, whatever it is. Um, and so they feed each other, right? So more divisive times bring in people that say, oh, here's an opportunity to play on this in order to you know, mobilize my own interests. Um, so it's, it, they're definitely fed by each other. Again, the reason I, I single out Donald Trump is because he did believe in the power of division. You know, he had a couple of smart lawyers listening to right-wing radio for two years to find the most incendiary topics that he could launch his campaign on. And what he learned was that, you know, fear of threat of immigrants coming in was the hot issue. So the first thing he said was about that. So he was very mindful of A, listening to where, where people's fears were in what was becoming his base and how to weaponize that. But those fears were there and polarization was escalating and he hopped on and wrote it like a, like a bull, right? So, you know, what did he contribute to it? Absolutely. His style of leadership and his way of leveraging power contributed to it, but it was not the only thing. He just saw it as an opportunity and jumped on it. So at least that's my take on him, on, on what he did. Okay. Timothy, Timothy Lyon. Hello. I have uh, two uh, very brief questions. The first, I would just be i um, interested in reading more about what you said uh, regarding uh, outrage triggering the same pleasure centers in the brain yeah. as heroin. I'd be interested in reading more on that if you have any yeah. sources for that. And then second, uh, you talked about positive deviance facilitation and how it's different from mediation. Um, and I was wondering if you know of any facilitators or trainers that could teach a mediator how to do this form of, of work. Yeah, so again, I guess one, well, um, so let me, let me shout, give a shout out to one group. There's a group in Richmond, Virginia uh, called Hope in the Cities. And v Richmond, Virginia, as you know, is a, um, you know, was the kind of epicenter of the slave trade. And racial relations there have been very fraught. And this group sprung up to deal with racial differences, but now has have been effective and successful in what they do and so uh, have moved into other kinds of divisive issues. And what's important about their model, I think, uh, as I've described before, is that they begin with dialogue. They begin with people discovering, learning stuff about themselves that they didn't know, the other story, the complexity of what they're trying to talk about. And then these groups form around, well, what can we do? What should we do? And then they mobilize and move into action. So that's one group that I would call out because they don't just use dialogue. Dialogue is great, dialogue is necessary, 
But I think in a time like ours, even dialogue is insufficient to the problem because it may open you up, but what do you do? Well, what, one of the things you can do is join with people, particularly people across the divide where you have a common goal and interest and get up and do something together. And I think that's a very powerful and profound uh, thing to do. So uh, um, Timothy, I'm happy to offer you other sources. The website for the book has a bunch of resources. Um, and you also may just go to the Bridging Divides Initiative website that I mentioned at Princeton and click in your area uh, on, and find where what are the bridge building groups that are out there? What are they doing um, uh, that are near you? Um, and, and ask, you know, have a, a set of criteria. Do they use dialogue? You know, do they do con contact in smart, uh, empirically informed ways? Do they use dialogue as opposed to, you know, again, negotiation is, is oftentimes more around persuasion than dialogue is. It's a different kind of process. Um, and then do they move into action? I think those are, those would be my criteria for judging and assessing whether or not I would join with a group or go study with a group. But Hope in the Cities is, a, is an example I'm familiar with, um, but there are many of these organizations, so I would recommend you find one. And yes, I will um, send a reference to this paper. This paper came out, I think, in January about, you know, outrage, addiction, um, I, I think there's actually a new book that's coming out on that, that someone told me that they're interviewing the author on. I don't, I don't know what this book is, but I'll, I'll send a link to the paper, I don't know, I guess to, to Julie, and maybe Julie, you can distribute it. Sure, or, or yeah, that, that's fine. We can include that in the follow-up email with the link um, to the recording, yep. Yeah. yeah, okay. Mark, you've been typing up a storm. What is your question? <laughs> It's, it's really more of a reinforcement of what I'm hearing, and that is, you know, as a, uh, as a former chemist physics uh, major, I have always thought of the, um, the question of how does the, you know, the building blocks of the universe energy relate to all of this, and, it, and to me it relates because it, 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 in, it, it has two characteristics, individual characteristic, and a relational, and, and, and to the degree that they're blended in how they respond to the collisions they make, and conflict is the evolutionary force, uh, they, um, they survive and they coalesce. Uh, here we're talking about how does that, what, what does that mean here? The process we use must encompass both of those and I think the, our, uh, the practice we have, the practices we have that, that, that do that are certainly, you know, mediation is a, is a way of dealing individually, but a more restorative approach, um, uh, a probing emotionally, the gaining of common, uh, a common, common history, et cetera, simultaneously or together, I think holds, and I think it, it kind of goes with what Peter's been talking about uh, that works. So to me, it really is a, uh, it's a reflection of the, of the, of, of, of the world and, and how, how uh, uh, environments are created that are healthy versus environments that are toxic. And, uh, you know, and this has been wonderful. I, I, you know, this scientific approach to me is, um, is, is really what, uh, what is uh, needed to, uh, to move things forward and and our approaches that we've been developing to me is, is really can be central to what Peter is, uh, has been describing. Well, Mark, Mark, you're one of my peeps. I appreciate your appreciation for the background of this. You know, uh, Kurt Lewin, who was my mentor's mentor, was very influenced by physics. Um, but part of what he said is, you know, so physics is a area in science and psychology is an area in science. And we can't necessarily take something that we see in physics and apply directly to psychology, but they probably share some underlying rules or laws or mm -hmm. principles that do apply to both. And that's what I've tried to identify. There are kind of seven what I call crude laws about how these patterns change and what we should know about that, um, that I do think are, are borrowed from physics or in, you know, uh, gleaned from physics um, but have real practical implications for sure. changing patterns like this. Yeah. Sure. 
It's a, okay, we have Kathy Orkin, Baruch Bush, and Lavinia in that order. We're running out of time, but let's keep going as long as we can. Kathy? Yeah, hi, Dr. Coleman. Good to see you. <laughs> so um, I don't want us to neglect um, the element of emotional uh, template that we all live with and the importance of being able to emerge into forgiveness instead of staying so steady to our roots. Uh, I don't know if you want to address that at all, but i uh, been working with a group with Mediators Beyond Borders and we're working towards how do we incorporate the emotional aspects of resolving conflict because if those aren't addressed, we're still not moving. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, as you notice, the, the first trend I talked about is affective polarization. And that's the thing that's usually measured most is how cold do you feel towards them and warm to your other to your, your group. It's core to this whole dynamic. Um, there are other elements that happen cognitively and behaviorally and structurally that we need to be mindful of, but definitely it is at its essence, this emotional uh, component. And for forgiveness is critical to this, but I have to say, you know, even this book, I think, is in some ways provocative at this time because there's so much energy still for the fight. People are so angry. The, the, the left is angry because Trump got in office and did all these things and damn it. And, you know, and so forget the Republicans. Let's just push through legislation. The what right is angry. This thing was stolen. They never gave him a chance, you know. There's tons of energy in, around the fight. There's less energy around repair, mm -hmm. but there is this group in the middle that is exhausted and feels fed up and they just want something else. That's the kind of emotional well I'm encouraging us to focus on mm -hmm. because we need to re-engage the middle and encourage their you know, engagement in our democracy in order for us to get to a, a better place where there's less control by the extremes. Um, Baruch Bush. Baruch Bush, I haven't seen you in a long time. That's absolutely true, Peter. It's lovely to sit here and watch you and hear from you and hear what you're doing. I want to be very quick so we don't keep you past your deadline. So lots of stuff struck me as you're talking. One of them is that the story about the uh, uh, two women, I think it was, at the beginning of the Public Conversations Project and their six-year conversation or engagement. And what was interesting about it, among other things, and I guess it's, uh, I'll, I'll try to limit myself. What was interesting about it to me is that they got more and more appreciative of each other, but more and more strongly different about the underlying issue. So I would call that uh, the alternative to getting to yes, which is living with no. And that was a wonderful example of that. More and more, it seems to me, that's a critical thing for us to learn how to do and to value. Uh, because there are a lot of things that we are not going to get to yes about anytime soon. Um, but uh, it might be easier, even though it seems harder, it might be easier to learn to live with no. Um, and that requires a lot of effort also, just this kind of stuff that you're talking about. Uh, that story was a great, I look forward to reading about that in your book and to looking up the, uh, I guess you said the Boston Globe article on it. Um, and that's what conversation is about. Maybe conversation is an even better term than dialogue. The Public Conversations Project started with that word and it's, it's a pretty good one. Um, so anyway, that was my thought I wanted to add. Uh, and thank you for all this. And I'm looking forward to getting the book and, and digesting all of this. Keep it up. Lots of success. Thank you, Baruch. I appreciate it. And I really like the, term, the phrase living with no. I, I think that should be your next book, living with no. <laughs> OK, well, I already wrote an article in with that title. But you know, a book is a longer project. All right, I'll, can you send that around? Yes, yeah, sure. I'll, I will uh, I will send it to, to Julie and to Nikki, and they can forward it to everybody, yeah. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Baruch. Um, and we have one more, but I'm not sure if she's still here. Lavinia? I think she may have 
had to go. It is after 10 o'clock. Um, technically, we're done. Uh, I don't know, Peter, if you have any extra time, if there are any other people who want to speak. I, I don't actually, I, I'm, I'm late for a meeting now, so I need to all go, right. but let me just again, thank you um, all for coming and convening and engaging and it's very thoughtful. And um, thank you for all you do, because you are the peace builders and peace makers. Hi. Yeah, you were terrific. Peter, I'm so sorry to interrupt. It's a shame that nobody had any. Hi, Peter, I don't know if you have to go. I know you have to go in a minute. I wanted to ask. You're, You're cutting out, out right now, now, Peter. You're breaking Hello. up. Can you no. hear me? Let me just say, Lavinia, we can't hear Peter? you. So send your question to Julie, and Julie will forward it to me. And yeah. I yeah, hi, I'm just sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Now? No, we can't, yeah, Lavinia. No. We need to go. But thank please. you all. Thank you, Peter. You've been amazing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.